Hello, everybody. Hello. I think we're going to get this uh, moving along. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. We wondered what kind of crowd we got, and I'm actually uh, very amazed and happy we have as many people as we have. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Jimmy Recor. I will moderate tonight, and I'm actually the moderator on the fifth. We are, after looking at all your handiwork, uh, the number one thing we're going to talk about is the South River action. The second vote getter was the solar, which is changing bios to the solar. <clears throat> and uh, the third was community preservation, and there's an A and B to that. There's the Habitat for Humanity House and monies for the river, for the South River. So, with the amount of time we have left, we're looking at basically 20 to 25 minutes for each of those three top issues. Okay, just some ground rules before we start talking. First of all, unlike the rest of the political climate and the rest of the political world, I believe we are adult and kind enough here to speak in decent tones to each other. So in saying that, since I am the moderator, I'm going to tell you if you get up or raise your hand and start the talk and seem unkind or mean or pointed in any way, in my, I'm gonna shut you down. I'm gonna ask you to sit down and think about what you were saying and maybe try to do it again. If you cannot do that, I'm going to be honest, you're going to sit back down and you're not going to have a chance to talk. Because fair is fair. We don't need to tear each other down here. We don't need to undermine people or say terrible things. We're all neighbors. We're all here because we care about Conway. And just because someone doesn't agree with you, with your idea, doesn't mean they're wrong. It means their life's experiences have led them to a different place than you have. Okay? Am I clear about this? Thank you very much. So first, we're gonna talk about the South River, and I'm gonna ask a little bit of a question because... Actually, Jimmy, can I just interrupt? Sure. Sure. Our state legislature, like our state representative, here. She's in the back with her corner to the wall, <laughs> Natalie Blair. <laughs> and thank you very much for being here tonight. <laughs> We're going to hold you to that. about that. Joe Strugowski, I thought you might be here just for that reason. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Sure. Can I take my mask off or do I have to wear it? You can talk however you okay. feel comfortable. There's nobody that close to you. All right. Um, there's a handout if you want more information than I'm going to give you. I'm just going to introduce it. There are actually four articles related to the South River Project. And the South River Project 
is an attempt by the town and the county, and I guess with the state's help, to try and mitigate the erosion and the flooding of the South River. We started on this, I think, just after Hurricane Irene, there was grants available to work on municipal vulnerability, and one of the projects was to assess the hazards on the South River from the beginning all the way up to the brooks out and the dam up in Asheville. So Asheville and Conway have both participated in this project for something like seven years. And somehow I got asked to be part of that because I was involved seven years ago. So I guess I'm sort of a friend of the South River, not an official member. But these four articles are related to trying to do some continuing work on the river. We did one project on which I guess is called the South River Park, where we uh, enhance the floodability of the park, if you will. And I think um, Michelle said, what, how many times did it flood in the last five or seven years? How many times was it? I don't know. It was, it was inundated, what, seven or eight times, seven, you said? Seven times, yeah. And then we correlated that with the <laughs> height of the river. So every time the river went up, the last seven times, the last seven severe times that happened, it flooded into the area and left sediment behind, which is part of the demonstration of that project that is trying to take sediment out of the river. The, these four articles are to extend that kind of work. Uh, in one area is further up Shelburne Falls Road. It's uh, where the fire trucks get filled up, or the, where the crossing is. If any of you are familiar with that area, it's across from John Harris's house. It's Malcolm Corse's old property, which is now owned by Jack Lockhead. Um, we'd like to do some more work there on erosion control, and we're looking for funding to do the work. A town share of any of these projects would be 25%, and then we would hope to get a matching grant for the rest of it. So at this point, there's one article to use CPA money to buy Mary Buys property, which is where, right where the um, fire trucks are filled with water. Uh, another is to buy the land between the river and the road of, is it Judith Waldo, uh, which is a little further north. And the third parcel is in the center of town. It's 69 Main Street. If any of you remember Joey Akershins, it was one of his houses at one point. It burned down two years ago. The owner is contemplating putting a house up there. We're interested in buying it for flood control. Not so much the side where the house was, but the low land on the other side. Um, back in 1939 or 40, after the floods in 38, they put some berms in the river and they tried to turn the river to go under the bridge. And the current thinking is that that is not the right approach to solve that problem. I think we've lost the retaining wall two or three times. Mm -hmm and it may be related to that berm, but the engineers that are working on this are you know, doing more evaluation of that. So we're looking for a total of $155,000. We've, we've located and the cyclone have uh, authorized us to look at using the money from the sale of the old grammar school and the money from the uh, logging operation that we did on town property. That's about 105000 and then we're asking for 50,000 from CPA funds. That combination of 155,000, we hope would be enough to buy all three parcels. And I think there's an additional 15,000 to do a, what's called a 21E assessment on the Main Street parcel. That had a history of being a uh, automotive uh, truck storage garage or bus storage garage. And, we're not sure what kind of chemical residue there might be. So as a town, in doing our due diligence, we would want to do an environmental assessment on that property, which is another 50. So if we, if we do the whole project, it's 170,000. And I'll let other people answer some of the more technical questions. Is there anything for me? Uh, yeah, I was just going to point out that of this money that we're requesting in these articles, all of it is existing money that the town has, so there's no current tax dollars okay. devoted to it. It's not going to raise your taxes or affect the tax rate at all. Taxes, but the matches is from the 
little bit of matches from the CPA money and then these, this other money that's already been set aside. Can people hear Janet or do we need to have people go to the mic? Is that okay? Okay. No questions? Questions? No questions for me? I did a hell of a job. Huh? Good job, Joe. Or I baffled them all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask again. Any questions on uh, Article 20, 21, 22? Yes? Mike for Columbus. We, uh, you brought up, this is news to me, that we got $100,000 left over for the logging up on Turkey Hill, right? Uh, no, a total of um, 80,000 80, from the old school we sold and 20 from the logging. So a total of 104,000. When I inquired about that logging up there years ago, the selectman said a portion of that money is going to go back into the state forest and to improve the roads to get to the cemeteries and all that stuff. And I haven't seen any of that done, so I'm just wondering if we're reneging on our agreement for the logging. Uh, this is the first I hear that. I guess we'll have to discuss that with the selectmen. There's none of the selectmen that were there at the time are here now. <laughs> The other question I have is, I'm skeptical about this watershed stuff. And the reason I'm skeptical of it, because when we had this article on here years ago for the mitigation in, we'll call it the Rose property, that's what everybody used to call it, they said that was gonna help prevent the flooding in the center of town. How was that gonna help the flooding in the center of town when it was below the center of town? That never made any sense to me. I asked the engineer that was there at the meeting, he didn't have an answer for me, because it doesn't make sense. The reason the center of town floods, if you lived in the center of town, it floods because of the water coming from the Conway Swimming Pool down through the brook and it can't enter the South River. It backs up, up to Academy Hill, and then it comes to the center of town. So we're talking about buying a piece of property, Yakushins, and mitigating across the river, right where I'm talking about the problem is, and we're gonna have the South River flood into there, and then the brook's gonna flood again, and it's only gonna make the problem worse, and I brought it up to the engineer, and he didn't have an answer for that one either. So I'm very skeptical of, of this kind of work being done. Okay, Mike, anybody want an answer? So, so. Well, yeah, you go first. Jack Lockhead, please. It's my understanding, and this is based on pretty flimsy information, <laughs> I hope somebody will back me up, is that the state has stated that that bridge is in dire need of replacement and that there are plans for the state to put in a new bridge that will have a much larger area underneath it so that the river will be able to flow. Because the bridge is what's backing everything up. Correct. Uh, does anybody know? Anyone else heard that the state has got plans to do that? Sure. How real I can't tell you about their plans. What I can tell you is as part of the work that we've done already on this project, it looks like the engineering firm is confirming your comment that the bridge opening is too small. I've heard that from a number of people. Mike is not the first person to tell me that. And I actually subscribe to that same theory. That one of the biggest issues is the opening of the bridge is too small. The engineering firm is still doing the analysis but it appears we will have engineering data to support that position and maybe help us with replacing the bridge. The challenge with the bridge is that the money is sent to Franklin County and then Franklin County manages the share of money that we get for that kind of work. And there's a, a huge long list of projects on that list mm -hmm. and the list continues to change. You can get on the list and then you can end up not on the list. When I was a selectman 30, 40 years ago, we used to go to the state rather than the county, and Tom um, Ward would come back and say, we're number 10 on the list. Next year he'd come back and said, we're now 250th on the list. And the next year we'd be honored on the list. Because people seem to keep, you know, priorities change and more important things come along. So I would venture that I have no idea when the bridge will be replaced. I noticed they just repaired it in the last couple of years, so. That's probably a band-aid that they intend to leave on for a while, but I don't, honestly, know. But we certainly would support that position, and we hope to have an engineering report soon that will say that that bridge is, you know, undersized, based on the hydrology study of the river. But all this work together, and I think 
to go back to Mike's comment, there's, I think, 20 or 30 places on the river that need work, and we can't, you know, there's a problem of priority and where to work and what's available to work on. The town site um, went high on the list because it was town-owned. Getting landowners' permission to do things is very difficult. You know, on the, even on the one we're working on now, we found two unknown owners of property. We didn't know who owned the property. Um, and so now we're negotiating with the landowners to see if we can buy these parcels that are between the river and the road, the two I referred to earlier. But it's been a challenging effort. Michelle, I think, wanted to. You know, I was just going to say, something that a couple people have already said, which is that there's multiple reasons why the river floods. The bridge is one of them, and it's a big one, but like Joe said, it could take decades to yeah. address. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, these other things, according to the engineers, would help. And when I was at the various meetings with the engineers present, I thought they did a pretty good explanation of why the, the um, basin downstream would help flooding upstream under the bridge back, you know, in the middle of town because when the water is in a channel, it's going very fast and it goes very high and it pushes back up the stream. But when it can go out into a floodplain, it actually drops the level of the river upstream as well as down. I would agree with that if the, if the bridge wasn't the choking point, but that's the problem. They're all problems, and they problems. Yeah, and also other sites that aren't even on these lists yet. And, um, yeah. So. It, I mean, the ultimate goal is to reduce the flooding and erosion in the economy. That's the, that's the main purpose of all of this work. And, and I guess, in, in the interest of full disclosure, this money is to do the engineering work. We would have to apply for other grants to actually do the work. So what we're trying to do here is buy our share of the project by buying these parcels. That becomes our 25%. And then uh, people are already working on trying to get us more grant money to actually do some of the work, that, you know, the actual physical work that needs to be done in the river. So this does not fund the actual work in the river at this point. This would be land acquisition that becomes yeah, our 25%. I, I have no issue with that. I guess it becomes our 25%. I don't know if we're trying to uh, so. prevent natural causes to happen. I think, every, does everybody know that where you're talking about, that river wasn't there? That's not where the river used to go? Which spot? Uh, uh, we're uh, across from where you had that mitigation. That river didn't go there. Oh, my, no, my it uncle moved that there. river. My uncle moved that river. Yeah. <laughs> And so it didn't go straight. That's why that's so straight. More by Bo Bobios, correct? Yeah, the Bobios was and, all flooded. But in the meantime, when it's straight, it has built up these berms of sand along the edges every time yeah. it flooded, which channelized it deeper and deeper so that when there's a flood, it goes faster and higher in that small channel. Mary? That could very be. Um, this is related and not related, but it, I don't know where it is in the conversation. And when we think about the South River coming down, goes around the corner, comes under the bridge, we're thinking about the um, stream coming down Pumpkin Hollow right behind the ball field. Mm -hmm. My understanding is the ball field used to be essentially wetland, and that seems to me like a prime place for some of the river to get to spread out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I know that they were spent a huge amount of effort to make that dry. But if you think about that stream coming down, hitting the South River, and having another place to have, you know, to back up, frankly, the ball field is another place. That's not a popular statement, but I'm just going to put it. We're going to put a million dollars into it. <laughs> that is a million dollar ball field, and it, and it, it is in a place that is a natural, spread out the water place, like Michelle was talking about. Mm -hmm. It was a flood plant. It was yeah. a flood plant. Well, it probably needs to stay in the ball field for a while. But <laughs> in, in the meantime, I'd just like to point out that just under the road, that goes up the hill by the ball field, 
that brook passes between a bridge which <laughs> narrows it again. Indeed. Which creates it's a another, high speed point. It's another site on the long list. Yeah. It could be overwhelming, Janet. <laughs> about the, the, the largest item on the, of these four, and you all left your hand out, and it says that acquire the land, the land at the mouth of a pumpkin hollow brook that we were talking about, mm -hmm. and that is where the, the burn that Michelle, Michelle talked about has been, was built up after, the, in the 1930s, as misguided engineers thought that that would help, and in fact, it worsened because there used to be the floodplain in there uh, where the water would spread out. And what the, the hope here is to just be able to acquire that piece and then they would remove, uh, allow water to, to flow in there, reach some of the, the big berm that's a big uh, blockage point and, uh, and allow it to spread out and dissipate. Um, we've been working this on this since uh, 2006, maybe. And of the assessments, this one spot was always at the top of the list for having the biggest impact in terms of the engineering and the hydraulics and the flood uh, uh, potential mitigation from that. And it's a, it's a difficult spot because it had a house and is still uh, on the market now for a huge amount of money. Um, but we just would like to ha have the funds approved to have it in place in case the town could then acquire it to um, remediate that really critical spot. Thank you very much. Any other questions about this? Because we're, yes, Jet, we're running up on our timeline for this discussion. But Jack, just a, a comment on the amount of money that comes from the Conway Forest cut. I think somebody does need to look at the. There was a town meeting in which me, money was set aside, and there were very specific restrictions on what that money could be used for. Whether this is an appropriate use or not, I think is a good question. We, I think Mike we, did, up we did check that, and it is appropriate. Okay. And the school money. They, they the school money, money, yeah, I have no question about the school money. It's just the woods. Uh, does anybody know if this commitment that Mike's talking about is actually written down somewhere? Or was it just a sidebar conversation? It was a, yeah. at the select board meeting when they talked about logging it, because there was a bunch of people opposed to it. And they're still in town. But oh. what was said was that they were going to improve the roads, the town roads out there, because there's still a town road that goes out to Four Corners and the cemeteries. And mm -hmm. They wanted to see some of that money used back in the state for us to improve the roads. So somewhere there should be, in, a, in the perfect world, there should be minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. Town clerk brings up a valid point. Should there be minutes? There should be. Right, so hopefully, yeah, maybe that's something we could ask the select board of town administrator to look into. I, I think it would be minutes of a town meeting. There should be where, where minutes of every select board meeting also. Specific use of the money we can find. Okay. Wouldn't that really have to be approved by town meeting though anyway? I mean the select board has a lot of authority, but not necessarily promise all that money. It would take a two-thirds vote of the town to do what Mike's talking about. So there must be minutes you know, from a town meeting somewhere. This is what the pre-town meeting is for. See? <laughs> okay. Now, shifting gears a little bit. The second big vote getter was Article 29 about the protective uh, zoning bylaws for large scale solar facilities. Can I have somebody please come up and speak to that issue? Yes. I will speak to that issue. Sure. Hi. I'm Beth Gershman, I'm the chair of the planning board. And um, I handed out uh, this little handout. It says proposed zoning bylaw revisions. You can skip the first two. We'll talk about that at town meeting. 
And the third one is um, really the highlights of the proposed changes that the planning board would like to make to this existing bylaw. So just to recap a little bit and to, and to reiterate for the manyth time, this does not apply to people's home solar projects. This is really focusing on large-scale solar facilities. So the planning board um, was motivated to make these changes because as we navigated the process with uh, Nexamp, who has pretty much completed construction on a large-scale solar facility on Main Poland Road, we noticed some things, <laughs> to, be, to be really clear about it. Um, we noticed some areas that we really thought could use addressing from the original bylaw, which was passed in 2011. So this really focuses on a, a several different areas. One of the biggest changes would be to require a special permit. Right now, um, all that's required is a site plan review. And what we're asking for is a, a special permit process to be put in place for large-scale for, for large scale solar facilities, um, which will give us all a lot more oversight and can help us address individual concerns and things that come up from specific site questions. Because uh, one thing that's going to be happening, we're pretty sure, in the next in the next number of years is there's going to be increased pressure to build large-scale solar facilities in areas of Massachusetts where there's land. It's just, it's coming down the pike, so we'd like to um, put this into place now. Uh, there's a few other things that would be changed from the existing, and if you look down the um, line, you can see that some of the, some of the things that we are very focused on is um, increasing the distance, property line distances, um, really focusing on uh, restricting unnecessary tree cutting, providing landscape screening plans to reduce, uh, to minimize visibility as much as possible, um, some focus on point source noise generators being lo uh, specifically located in the middle of, uh, uh, located farther from adjacent properties, um, a restriction of height, unless it's a dual use agrovoltaic, which we can talk about if people are interested in that, um, that there would be hours and days of work for any construction planner, um, that the, the site plan review would include pre-construction photos from the right-of-way and the abutters, and a visualization of post-construction views from abutters, as well as a statement from acoustic, an acoustic engineer about noise levels. Um, and a focus on a forest clearing of greater than 10 acres. So that's some of the high, highlights. Are there questions or comments? Mike. I got a question about it. Um, have you done any uh, surveys of the owners in town that have farms? Because that's what you're really talking about here, for the most part. We're not. Wait, 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 they can make a whole lot more money yes. off the solar than they can grow on vegetables. Yes. And right now in town we have some dairy farms, old farms that have grown up that those people might want to do what the other farmers in the right. lower valley have done. Right. And this is, to me, it's just going to restrict the hell out of them. We actually deliberately try not to restrict that. Where, do you, where are you seeing the restriction piece? Well, well, right now, it's just a site plan review, you said, right? Yes. So now you're having general requirements of 
wetland protections, well, um, all kinds of undisturbed land. There's a, I mean, everything that you have listed here is a restriction. Can, can they I could respond? adhere to it, but it's another hoop that they got to jump through to do what they want with their land. Yeah, I'm going to call Mary in a second. I, I, I want to reassure you that one of our primary concerns as we, as we walk through this process was to protect private property rights of, of our landowners in town. A lot of the surrounding towns, we, we worked by looking at a lot of surrounding towns um, proposed by our visions, including Wadeys and um, Ashfield, uh, as well as some other of the hill towns in our area, and looked, uh, used extensively um, some of the uh, guides for making these kinds of bylaws, because a lot of towns are grappling with this right now. Um, we, some, some towns are uh, heading in another direction where they're not allowing solar on, on farmland. That's not the direction we're going in at all here. Mary, you to say. So, one of the things I would say about this is that um, anybody who's considering doing a large, this is large scale. So this is big, this isn't a, you know, thing the size of this room, this is large scale. Any, any business that is considering doing that kind of thing, and any farm that is, or any landowner who is considering leasing, it is, um, it's a high budget item. And the site plan review requires all kinds of plans, and this, what the special permit does is it does this does require some more than what it, that it requires more a lot more it requires a lot more however this wouldn't be our local landowner putting up a big solar farm this would be our local landowner leasing land to a large company that has the capacity to do that scale we're talking huge amounts of money so this kind of permitting is very common in these kind of projects, and they're set up to do this kind of engineering, to set up to do this kind of permitting. But what the big difference it makes is it allows the people who live in Conway to, you know, say, hey, we want you as a neighbor to do what you need to do with your land and have the right to do what you do with your land. But what you do with our land impacts the rest of us too. So it gives us an opportunity to ask questions, to say, hey, I have a concern about this, I have a concern about that, and to work it out together. Um, and it does that, it allows that up front, rather than, you know, figures, you know, put something in and then it's like, wow, we didn't think about that. <laughs> and so it is, it is, on the one hand, it is more restrictions, but it is actually very, it is what it is, is providing for a process for all of us to be involved. And it is very different than somebody who has a piece of land and is just doing what they want to do with their land, and whether it's farming or logging or whatever, but this kind of, this kind of thing can have a big impact on the community and it gives the community a chance to have some conversation around it. So, and it's also, Sometimes it seems like when I think about a landowner that I know in Conway that has a chunk of land, and I think, and especially farmers who no, no farmers are getting rich these days, they're not necessarily going to have a lot of money. So the thought of, oh my God, the farmer's going to, you know, they're going to have to do all this stuff for permitting. Well, what they're dealing with is a huge company that has all the, they have the, you know, the engineering offices, they have all the capability of doing that, and they're used to doing that. So it's not like it's a burden on the farmer or the landowner. It's, um, it's saying to the company, okay, we want you to be here in town, but you need to do it right. That's just so, my view. So in terms of the wetlands piece, this, this, is, a, this is just a, this is a reiteration of existing wetlands law. It's, it's nothing new, actually. Bob Armstrong. So, so related to my comment uh -huh. um, about, are we increasing the restrictions? Are, uh, 
Um, I don't know what the restriction used to be, but I believe this says no solar facility larger than 20 acres. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a restriction. So the slopes. Slopes. It also talks yeah. about slopes. Yes. Uh, but but I don't believe in the original solar bylaw you had a maximum size. Well, the maximum size um, tends to be the maximum size that any solar facility in the state can be, and that's actually pretty close to 20 acres. I think it's 23 acres. 20 is close enough. 20 the 20 is close enough. The state yeah. maximum is five. Well. Let me clarify anything I say about the limits. The limits, the SMART program, which is the solar program in Massachusetts, really doesn't have a whole lot of limits. What it has is um, sticks and, and uh, you know, carrots and sticks. It says you can do it, but you won't get reimbursed at a high rate. Or if you do it, you know, you'll get a higher rate. So it, it, it has incentives and disincentives. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the wetland, it says that you, if you put solar in the buffer zone, you can still get solar credits, which was one of the arguments that happened in Conway. The, the solar company was arguing they could go in the buffer zone. Our, our CONCOM was saying, no, you can't. But the state law says you can go in the buffer zone and still get credit. If you go outside, you know, closer to the wetland than the buffer zone, whatever that is called, then you won't get credits. So it's, it didn't say you couldn't do it. It didn't say you can't take the wetland away, but it says if you do, you don't get credits. And the, and the whole SMART program was based on that. And it, so it says the limit is five uh, megawatts. If you go above that, you don't get any more credits. You can put in a bigger one, but you don't get any uh, credits from the state. There's no financial benefit. No financial benefit. No financial benefit. Right. So when we say you can or can't, so the, the five, the 20 acres that Beth is talking about correlates with the five megawatt, which is the upper limit if you want to get credit yeah. for your you know, smart program credits for your inside. Just to be clear. The, the restriction on the slopes, there's a couple of restrictions on slopes that already exist, and one of them is from the industry itself. There, there's a certain slope point at which they're not going to put anything, they're not going to do it. Um, the 15% slope greater than 15% is also subject to waiver by the planning board. So a lot of things with a special permit process, we can really look at these things site by site and take a look more closely at what an individual site is like and what uh, might be impacted by a large scale solar facility on that individual site. Because everything, can be, it can be different, you know. Right now, the existing, the one that's, that has almost been concluded, you know, had a butters very close to the property line. That might not be the case in most, in, in, in the future, in any future site that gets picked up for lease. Yes? Um, I'm, in discussing what effect this has on the price, that farmers are going to get for their land. It seems to me that if the developer is going to incur X amount of dollars in costs to meet the requirements of the permitting process, that increased cost that the developer is going to have is likely going to affect the price that he's going to offer mm -hmm. the farmer for the use of his property. So I don't think that we can say we're just basically putting fees on people that can afford to pay them, because I think it's going to trickle down. Well, that's, you know, that's possible. I don't really have a sense of the kinds of um, leasing costs that are currently being paid yearly by uh, mm -hmm. for large-scale solar. That isn't something that I'm personally aware of, but I do know that it's a tremendous amount of money. Um, one of the, a really big uh, deterrent for um, somebody to pick a site is the presence of three-phase power nearby. You know, and that's not, that's not controlled by us or by the landowner or by anybody other than the, than the existing utility company. So there's already, you know, like restrictions 
on what's an appropriate site and what's a not an appropriate site that has absolutely nothing to do with our process at all. It's not as if anywhere in town or anywhere in Western Mass can be selected as a, as a large-scale solar facility. It's dependent on a couple of factors that are totally beyond the landowner's control and, and, the, and the town government's control. I think you're answering a question I wasn't asking. Can I? Okay, but I guess what you're saying is like there's unknown costs that we, yeah, I, I guess I am not so answering your question, I'm sorry. My, guess, my assumption is that if you're in a business and you, um, you have a, you know, like very little cost to, um, Make do your project. Um, that sure, you might be more likely to pay more money to a landowner because it's going to be a cheap project to run. And that clearly there are pieces of property that could be more expensive because of site costs. And there and permitting costs is something that is factored into all these projects. And I think if you look at bylaws across the state. Mm -hmm. Special permits, I think, are very common. Mm -hmm. And then I think a lot of, you know, I think it's factored into their cost. I mean, I think it's factored into their cost. So I can't imagine. I mean, maybe there'd be a case where, I don't know, you could have, you have what we ever know, but say landowner A in Conway has, you know, is negotiating a deal right now on our current bylaw, and they're saying, we're going to give you X number of thousands of bucks a year for your, you know, per acre for your land, and that, you know, would it be X minus something else if this passed? I find, I think the scale of these things, I don't think it's going to be that big a difference. That's just my sense because of what it is the sort of, the sort of the cost of doing business for one of these businesses. Now, I'm, I'm not speaking against the, the, the permitting process, only speaking related to the effect on the farm. In the back. Yeah, this is Ben. Uh, Thank I'm, you. So I'm a new member of the planning board. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, and by the way, there's a vacancy on the planning board. <laughs> if, anybody, <laughs> if, anybody, <laughs> if anybody is interested in, in being part of this really fun team. Vacancies all over the this year. Anyway, uh, so what I wanted to say was, so. Um, the site plan review basically led us through a little bit of a process, apparently when we were able to approve the next Um We weren't actually approving it, we were simply putting some constraints on it. And as we went through the process of next Samp being constructed, we realized that there were gaps in the bylaw. We didn't have any way of enforcing anything. We didn't have any way of making them do certain things. And what the, what the special permit does is it gives us some authority. It lets us say, no, you really do have to put a fence and it has to be like this. Or you really do have to dig this channel the right way so that it doesn't flood on your neighbor's lawn. I mean, it just gives us a little more um, control over the process. It, it, I mean, frankly, it, there's nothing in this bylaw, the way it's revised, that would keep uh, Will Boyden from putting a 20-acre solar farm on his field. Now, I live on Murray Brook. I would like to see that when I drive by it. But if that's what he is going to do, this bylaw wouldn't keep him from doing that. It would keep somebody from doing something that was not good for the town in, in overall terms of managing the neighborhood or the field, um, the property. It just it gives us a little more power in that regard. So that's the purpose of and the change. The current special permit fee, if I'm correct, is only $165. Yeah. That's, that's not going to, well, that's, is it a little more? They paid about fifteen thousand dollars for the permit. Well, for, for the for permit. Twenty acres. Yeah. Twenty acres. The, the folks who live right next door, I think, wanted to say something. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, well, I just wanted to say that there are a lot of changes to the solar large scale solar bylaw. Some of them do put those restrictions, actual restrictions, but a lot of them are really just protections for the neighbors to have some interaction with the project and to have some, the town to have some teeth, like Sue was saying, and accountability to the neighbor's rights to do what they want to do on their property and have their, you know, their sense of their um, home unchanged and, you know, as, as little as possible or affected or, you know, to prevent adverse effects. <laughs> Things like erosion or, you know, wind damage or, um, 
habitat loss and those kind of things. So, um, I'm a, you know, there are so many changes. I hope we don't throw the baby out of the bathwater just because of some restrictional issues. And I hope we're able to either, I don't know if we'll have to break it out and go item by item. I know that's a pain in the a neck at the town meeting, but I don't know if there's some way that we can look at those things and just remember that you know, we're all trying to live together and, and not trying to limit each other's freedoms, um, but we are all trying to respect each other's freedoms and have that be a dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I make one part of the comment? I, I, I was, I'm on the committee, I'm now an associate member, and, and I work hard with the members of the current committee. And I really think this is the right thing to do, the special permit process. But I just want to tell you a little side story. The most interesting uh, seminar that I participated in what had an investment banker in the room mm -hmm. uh, talking about solar. And the state got in trouble because we were putting solar systems on farmland and in the forest. So they tightened that up. He said the problem is, they said put them on landfills and put in canopies. You can't get anybody to loan you money to put things on landfills, because landfills are unstable and they emit methane gases. And so nobody, you can't get anybody to invest in those. Same thing with canopies. They're a, a very uh, highly engineered structure. It's a big airplane up in the air and it's prone to falling down. <laughs> so it is a, it's a high risk and people don't want to invest in those. So we're trying to push the industry in the direction that money doesn't want to go. You know, the people are going to go where it's easiest to do the job. And right now, it's farmland and forest land. So we're, we're trying to work a way where we can have some, <laughs> you know, but we're trying to tighten it up. So not all of our farmland, some of our farmland might get converted, some of our forest, has already been converted. In my opinion, the land that got converted was marginal land. It had been forested, and they kicked the forester out because he made a mess. So yeah, it's it was, I think, a total of 30 acres. 20, 20 acres of panel, 25 acres inside the fence, and I think a total of 30 acres that were clean to deal with the shadows. But it wasn't a good 30 acres of land. So in my mind, it was a fair trade. And we're trying to I kind of keep that philosophy going here. We're trying to restrict how big they can be and how much good farmland they can use, because that's what they're going to be looking for. And they're going to be looking for farmland. So we are trying to balance that. If you vote this down, I'm pretty sure they'll all show up in the forest or on farmland. And there, there's no landfills, and there's, there's no parking lots in the canopies in Conway. Kind of like <laughs> so what are your choices? My like question is very practical. I, I've never seen this solar thing, and I don't like to see the solar fields. I think it's terrible. But <coughs> you put, I mean, let's not be around the bush. There is restrictions in this thing to prevent that stuff from happening. With the grades, with the permit fees that you're going to have to do, you may be talking to big business that can pay it, but, but you might not. So that solar field that you're talking about, <coughs> 30 acres, with these restrictions and the things you, <coughs> excuse me, have in here, do you think that, that would be it would happen? Yes. Yeah. It would, but if, if, more as I mentioned, <laughs> sorry, not But as I mentioned, if there's appropriate sites in Conway that that uh, <coughs> the solar developer wanted to use that had access to three phase power, because that's important, um, do I think that people would still come in? Yes. Yeah. And, well, and the, the, but the specific project, <coughs> the specific matching of project that is right now on Main Poland Road could have happened on, with this bylaw with different orders of conditions right. with some more requirements and with the planning board and the town having to wait and enforce them. It still no. could have happened. Yes. Michael, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Bob, last, last comment. Okay, so as I read this, I just want to make sure I'm reading it correctly. And so, to me, I'm reading a change from the original bylaw, but to me, the change is that this now pertains to all solar, not just large solar. No. In other words, I see that you've removed the word large almost everywhere, occasionally <coughs> putting in LSFS for large-scale solar facility, but over and over it says, you know, these are the requirements for solar generation in Conway. 
you know, with the word large removed. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to read this in a way that I think it doesn't pertain to all solar in Conway. Susan, do you want to respond to this? Or yeah, so, so what we did, Bob, was, um, so we have a few things that pertain to all solar. Okay. Could you either speak louder or come on? Please come and speak to it. Okay. Good to see you. Yeah. Let me tell you, this was a piece of work. <laughs> it really was. And it, it, it's funny because I went on the planning board. I thought, oh, this is good. It'll just be a couple of meetings. <laughs> and what, this is this this was a big job. So what we tried to do was we tried to straighten it out so that there were some things that would apply to all solar. Okay, in terms of um, let's see how we did this here. Um, one second. Some things apply to all solar. Um, you still need a bar building permit. That's the same. You needed that before it, for as of right. You still need a site plan review if you're going to be a little bigger. That's, a, that's just the way it was before. And then you need a special permit if you're going to be a large-scale solar facility. So if you've got a, a medium-scale solar facility, you still have to provide a lot of stuff you had to provide before because we always had a site plan review for your medium-scale, for all of your solar facilities, whether they were large-scale or medium-scale. You still had to have a site plan review. So that site plan review is the same as it was before. It's just got a couple of wrinkles in it here and there, pre-construction photos, visualization. We just want to be sure that, that everybody knows what it's going to look like when it's done. And then you go to the large-scale solar facilities, and that only applies to large-scale solar facilities when they have to have both the site plan review. They still have to have the site plan review, which they always had to have before. But now they also have to have this special permit. And the special permit is basically designed, you know, in the planning board, we travel this really delicate line between trying to be sure that we represent the, the business interests of the solar facilities and also represent the town of Conway. So we're, we're trying to make it work for everybody. And this large-scale solar facility um, change seemed to be the best, best way to make it work. So it, it's not that we're, it might look like we're eliminating large everywhere, um, but what we're doing is we set, we totally restructured it, set aside a few things that apply to everybody, and then most of the big changes apply to large scale. Does that help? And, so, thank you. and none of this applies to residential solar. None of it applies to residential at all. None of this applies to residential. Yeah. Yes, yeah. We'll find out. So, yeah, so the, like, the kind of solar that Jack has, the people putting stuff on your roof, this is not that. This yeah. is commercial solar facility. Yeah. And we all have to be clear that this is what free town meeting is for. Cool. We have to try it. Okay, Mary. Thank you all for your questions. I'll stop talking. <laughs> okay, and last of, of the three, which is getting slighted a little bit, but it's okay. I, I love the discussion as long as. We're moving forward and understanding each other. Uh, next would be community preservation money for A, the river project, and B, the habitat for humanity. I can do the river. Uh, Mary? What? You want to do the river and I'll do the, do the I can do the river. Okay. okay. Joe Shigat, the uh, upper part, the, the one I mentioned earlier, we're asking for 50000 to help with the land acquisition as part of those three parcels that I discussed earlier. And the other 15 is to do a 21E environmental assessment on the 69 Main Street parcel. Should we proceed with the purchase, we want to be sure that it's a clean site environmentally. We probably wouldn't buy it if it was highly contaminated because the, the new owner takes on the responsibility. So Where without a plan to clean it up, we probably would Where not. Where is 69 Main Street, Joe Jackson? That's the Evans, the Joey Ackerson, South River Trust, whatever you want to call it. It's that. It's where the house burned down two years ago, and the land between uh, Academy Hill and the river. And Mary, you have one? Okay. So the other project. So I'm on the. I'm Mary Clinton. I'm on the planning board and also on the community preservation committee. Um, and community preservation committee. Um, proposals come to use Community Preservation Act money, Community Preservation Act money, 
Preservation Act money is that extra little bit that we pay in our property taxes, and it goes into one a big bucket of general, but then at town meeting we always plop it into different um, well different accounts to, for each of the priorities of community preservation, which is like open space, recreation, historical preservation, and affordable housing. So we so the the second um, so in the community preservation committee, the way the system works is. Um, like, so Joe came to the Community Preservation Committee and said, hey, we have, we want to do these projects on the South River, we need some money, can we use some of the money from the Community Preservation Act to do that project? And we said, yep, you filled out your application right, yep, it fill, fills the requirements of Community Preservation Act money, so yep, you can go to town meeting, town meeting can decide. The second project is um, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, um, that great organization that um, helps people um, own homes by, uh, how many people have heard about Habitat for Humanity? Excuse me, I'm going to interrupt for one second. Someone with a convertible has their lights on. Oh. Ooh. I mean, <laughs> whoops, thanks. I have jumper cables. And um, so, so Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, um, basically um, gets um, built houses with the homeowner, the person who's going to be the homeowner helping build and a lot of community volunteers, a lot of donated stuff, and they need to raise some money to also, you know, pay for, you know, like site costs or various things. So Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity was, had a piece of property in Con Conway donated to it. Um, that and it's the property that's right next to Howard Boyden's driveway across from the Baker farm across the way. Right that's up there. Right, right there. up there. Just if you if you head up towards the center of Conway, there's the sugar house, there's the jungle woods, and then there's a bear patch of land that's been recently logged, that property. And have, and they've been given that piece of property and they want to build a house that people will apply who have certain income um, that, can, that they'll be able to afford, what is it, like $128,000 mortgage or something, but it'll be less than if it was sort of a market rate thing, and they contribute with sweat equity. So they, and they, mm -hmm. Habitat, Valley Habitat for Humanity um, depends on support from all different kinds of directions, including community support. And they often use, what was it, like 100 some odd houses across the state have been built by Habitat for Humanity using CPA funds. The CPA funds is one of the ways. And right now, Conway has something like $126,000 in the housing bucket related. Our Community Preservation Act money we have $126,000 set aside related to housing. So they've asked for, was it $45,000? $45,000 to help with some of the site costs, the stuff they don't get donated, all that kind of stuff. And they came to the Community Preservation Committee, we said, yeah, you fill that replication right, yeah, it fits our criteria, yeah, we send it on to town meeting. So town meeting gets to decide, do, is this money we already have sitting in this pot that came out of our tax dollars, do we want to use some of that money? So it would, it would, draw down that 126,000, so we still would have like 80,000 maybe left over for housing related stuff in the future. We also have like, something like $500,000 or something in the general pot, I don't know, something like that. So anyway, that's what, that's what this article, that's what that part's about. And Amy Landry, who lives in Main Street, in the center town, works at Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity and has handout information and can also answer any kind of questions. But that's just, and I want to say, I live right there, and this is right there, and I'm like really excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great. So. I'll just add a couple of quick points about Habitat for Humanity. Use the mic. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mary. <laughs> great. Uh, so we build homes with first time home owners. Uh, and these are folks who are earning generally uh, up to 60% of the area media income. So for a family of four these days, that's about that's up to about $51,000. Uh, 
Um, and for all of us who are homeowners or know anything about buying a home, you know that that's a big stretch to get a home, um, Conway or elsewhere in these er in this area, um, on an income at that level. So we have a rigorous process for bringing our homeowners on board. Uh, they first of all have to demonstrate a housing need. Um, they also need to demonstrate a willingness to partner. And what that means is they put in about and around 250 hours per adult in the household to help build their own home. And as Mary said, the homes are built with, um, with volunteer labor just about completely. We do also work with the local vocational schools. So in this case, it would be Franklin County Tech, we hope. Um, COVID has changed a lot for us, as you might imagine. Um, once we do have our homeowners on board here, uh, the other thing they need to demonstrate is the ability to pay an affordable mortgage. We do not give the homes away. So folks are hardworking, generally young families, although we did sell a home to a grandmother and grandson not too long ago. Not that grandmothers are not young. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean. And uh, it's also just, this is kind of where you all come in too, because this is a home that will be deeded uh, we hope, in perpetuity, affordable. So when the family that buys this home is ready to move on, it'll be sold to another family like them, ready to own a home, you know, wanting to do it, unable to do that through conventional mortgage financing uh, channels. We are also the holders of most of our mortgages. We're, on, we're building house number 50 right now. Um, so we're a bank in addition to being a construction company. Uh, this home, however, because it's in a rural community, we will probably try to partner with the future homeowner to get a USDA mortgage. So lots of people, lots of entities, lots of partnerships make this happen, including um, the residents of a local committee, a community rather, where we're building. And as Mary said, we're, we get CPA funding from many of the communities in which we build. Right now we're building in Shootsbury and in Pelham and in Northampton, uh, all of those communities uh, came up with, with CPA funding to help make this happen. I have handouts, can I, I'll probably go around and distribute and I can answer as I go. Hold okay. on, Joe. Okay. I saw two hands in the back before. Mike Kirkalonis and Phil, do you still have questions? Yeah, uh, talking about the purchase of the uh, Zero Main Street here, Yakushin Hill property. So we've got a purchase price that we plan on buying it for, but What's the contingency for what we're going to cost to clean it up? There's a foundation there, there's a septic tank there, there's a leach field there that I would assume you're going to want to clean up and remove as well. So we, we kind of learned that on the last house we, we bought down on, uh, next to the ball field. It was way more expensive than we originally thought. Well, I, I can't speak directly to I'm not worried about that. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, let's finish this. Bill? Yeah, just so that, uh, so that when, when, um, when the uh, homeowner receives the CPA money, or uh, as it works, there is a deed restriction to repay the CPA money back to the town, right? No. So the money does not go to the homeowner. It goes toward, it's to Habitat, our nonprofit organization, toward the cost of building. As Mary mentioned, probably site work, you know, the things that we don't get covered. Um, or don't have volunteer labor, labor to be able to do. Uh, I was Mike, it's an outright gift. We don't get the money back. Right. It's, it's, this is a grant. Bill, to, to answer your question, we're going to answer an outright gift. We don't have the money back. What, what we get is, you know, right? So if the town's putting in money for this, would it priority to someone local to have first choice? Yeah. 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 The way it works is that um, all eligible applicants, after we screen them for their financial ability to be able to you know, pay an affordable mortgage, it's a lottery. So all eligible applicants go into a, into a hat and their name is drawn. I certainly hope that uh, we'll look to all of you to help get the word out locally. Um, people have already come up to me to ask you know, what the process is. They have kids they'd love to see move back here, and that may be a way they can afford to move here. Any other questions? Yes. Jack. It's my understanding that there, there, well, there are three pools of money 
in the CPA, and we seem to have no difficulty spending the money in two of them. <coughs> but have we ever spent any money in housing? No. So it seems to me that yes. we could eventually get in trouble with the state if we keep increasing the pool of money in housing and never spend it. So it, it seems to me that the, one of the reasons to do this is, is to protect ourselves from some future task from authorities. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. I know that yeah. you know my interest, and I will be um, leaving the planning board as a formal member, hoping to be an associate member. And my interest is like, okay, we have CPA money related to housing. What can we be doing to help? You know, could we have a fund to help people renovate their houses into two families so that they could, you know, have right. one affordable unit and afford to stay in their big house? So that's another issue. That's a whole other issue. But, but we spent 20 years looking for a housing project well, we and have not yet found one. We haven't, we haven't found a project. We did spend probably $70,000 on, on the planning for the complex. The, the senior, senior housing. Senior housing. But it never happened. Correct. It didn't happen because it was. So what about questions for Joe's part? Are there, oh, let's this one. Oh. Are there um, what are the state requirements for having a certain percentage of affordable housing for what purpose? And I, I don't know what I'm asking exactly, but does, does this count towards our affordable housing? Ten percent. Does this count towards Conway's? Housing. We would work with the town to apply to the State Department of Housing to, for uh, deeding it affordable in perpetuity. So, yes, we would go to the court and do it. Yeah, because I wondered how much affordable housing we currently have in town. That's a great question. We have zero list here. <laughs> we have affordable housing, but to be affordable, I have to have a deed restriction. Oh. It's forever in perpetuity, and we have none of them. So we have houses that may cost that amount, but yeah. they're not restricted to being affordable. And at the time of our CPC application, I think on Zillow, at that moment, the average price of a home in Conway was 275000 which for somebody making minimum wage or a little bit better, um, that, that's not an issue. <laughs> We used to have a housing committee, and you may remember Pixie Holbrook for many years, and with a design for a small senior complex. And then when that was not a good site and was too expensive and so forth, and then that committee just disbanded, and so we have not had a dedicated housing committee. I think the planning board's tried, trying to take it on, but they're so busy with um, solar and everything else, uh, but it's certainly an opportunity for good people to work together and come up with good ideas. And yes, CK money can be used for rental assistance and down payments and all sorts of things. And, and, I don't, yeah, and we can talk about, if anybody's interested in housing issues in Conway, I'd be happy to talk to them. Partly is because of my role on the planning board, partly because of my work for Community Action Pioneer Valley. I'm part of something called the Small Town Housing Working Group that is a bunch of small towns in Franklin County trying to address exactly these kinds of issues and trying to you know, figure out ways to increase affordable housing, make it possible for people to stay in their homes in town, etc. And so I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that, but yeah, not, that's not on this agenda. But Joe, yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Just, uh, yes. People can volunteer to help build the building, right? Yes. So, uh, but people in Conway can can come and help work on it. Absolutely, and and that's something I can't make a promise for when that will happen because with COVID we are under strict right. health and safety guidelines, of course. But those are, as we know, daily changing. So we're looking forward to the days we'll be able to welcome folks back, and we're on the verge of breaking ground. So. We're hoping that, you know, sometime in the near you know, future that will happen. So, yeah, we watch you for that. It will be in the visitor for sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have a handout, so anyone who wants more information about Habitat or about this project. Okay, it's, it's basically third.
Right, except that there were questions about the property. Mike wants to go back. Uh, oh, Mike wants to go back, yes. Mike? It can answer that question, the cleanup on that property. I can give you the short answer or the long answer? Uh, short one. Go short. Where's the money going to come to the state? After 155000 we hope we can do everything with that. If we can't, it'll be well, That's included in it. We're hoping to take care of everything. It's a very fluid, you know, we haven't. We just got the appraisal yesterday, so now we can talk to the plans to be interested in selling at those prices. What should the market for? Um, that, which one? Main Street? Uh, 175000 for the MPR. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is a kind of wound down to the point, yes? Okay, that's good. For what it's worth, before you leave, first of all, I'm very happy you came tonight. It's nice to see people in a group discussing things. Second of all, I want to leave you with this. Well, wait, I'll do two more. First, if, you, if your interest was spurred by something that went on tonight, do your homework before town meeting. And if you find things out you think are interesting, share that with other people, because that's gonna help us. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with tonight is from my Sunday visits at Baker's store, I thought that was the senior community complex in the town. <laughs> We are leaving everything. Bruce wants to do it all himself. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Appreciate it.